Welcome to How to Talk to Weirdos, employee surveys show that the most common complaint in corporations is communication. Communicating within your own team is challenging enough, but what happens when an introverted scientist and a gregarious salesperson need to work on an important project together? Self-described weirdo, Jeremy Doran is here to help. As host of the How to Talk to Weirdos podcast, Jeremy shares everything he's learned about communication as an engineer, speaker, coach, and student of psychology. He shares his findings, tips, and techniques, plus his conversations with experts to help all of us, especially us weirdos, talk to each other effectively. And now, here's Jeremy Doran. Welcome to How to Talk to Weirdos. This is a podcast all about communicating with people who are different than you are. As I grew up, I often didn't understand people. They often didn't understand me. And so I thought they were weird and they thought I was weird. And I was told that once or twice. So in my life, I've worked really hard at getting better at communication, hopefully with some success. And what happened is as I was studying more and learning more about communication, what I found out is that everyone's a weirdo. Everyone thinks, processes, and communicates so differently that it can cause a lot of miscommunication. So that's what we're here to explore, ways that we can make communication a little bit easier. And today's guest is Alan Langer. He's an international sales trainer and coach, professional speaker, podcast host, and best-selling author with close to three decades experience in the world of sales, content marketing, consumer influence, and what he calls the art of inherent human behavior. His book, The Seven Secrets to Selling More by Selling Less, is a national award-winning bestseller on Amazon, and he's been featured and interviewed on over 100 podcasts and radio shows, and we're just adding one more to it right now. (laughs) His company, The Seven Secret Sales Academy, helps businesses of all size, as well as individual professionals, increase their sales significantly by training his proven seven secret sales approach and philosophy. Some of his specialties and most popular talks include the art and psychology of pricing, body language and sales, writing proposals that win more jobs, and more. Alan, welcome. It's great to have you here. Jeremy, thank you. I got to shorten that bio. That takes too long. I'll, I'll, I'll for the second com- for the second episode, I'll send you a shorter bio. All <laughs> Sorry right. Sorry about that. <laughs> I like how you just invited yourself back. I like it. <laughs> welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah. All right, so I just read the bio and it says all the things that you do, but before you became a coach and author and speaker, you had years of sales experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about what type of sales, who you're meeting with, and and any other details? Yes, I spent um, close to 30 years in sales and and I did quite a bit of B2B, but I spent the majority, especially the last 16, 17 years in the B2C realm. I was selling to homeowners. I sold Anderson windows for a living. Uh, prior to that, I was selling sunrooms and roofing and siding for Home Depot and things like that. So I was in the in the sale where I had to go into a house and in two hours sell a $40,000 window job or a $50,000 sunroom. Uh, that's what we had to do. If you didn't sell it, you moved on. You didn't have that customer to follow up with. You didn't send proposals. You were It was a one-call close deal. And um, I think that made me a better salesperson because I learned how to talk to people better. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you follow a sales script, people don't like you. That's why people don't like salespeople. So I learned how to, um, like I, like you said in the bio, the art of inherent human behavior. People behave certain ways. Their minds uh, react to things certain ways. And once I figured all that out, I became very successful. Nice. How many sales meetings a day were you going on? Uh, in it, When it was busy, three a day, six days a week. So. 15 to 18 a week so it get you it was it, it's a high burnout profession uh, especially when you're doing uh, three a day and and I actually uh, as I got further along into my career I realized that less was less is more and and Anderson adopted that philosophy because they realized that running their reps three a day six days a week is not conducive to success for not only the company but for the customers you start getting bad reviews when you're in your third your third appointment at the end of the day and you're just not doing it well and um, so they stopped three a day and they, they moved to two a day after I started doing it. Just after you left they they made that change. Just after I left, yep. <laughs> <laughs> well the good thing is you got a lot of experience and a lot of practice doing it yes. and 
I imagine with all of that, meeting with people there are a lot of variety in the type of people that you met and the way that they communicate can you talk a little bit about that yeah so one of the chapters in my book one of the secrets is to really try to identify the personality that you're speaking to and every like you said at the beginning of your podcast everybody is different everybody's a weirdo from a communication standpoint but there are certain buckets if you will that people fall into and no one is in one bucket everyone has like one firm foot in another bucket but then they have a toe the other five toes in five other different buckets so there's there's a culmination of personalities but for example you know you're you're from the engineer world and i and when we first met we talked about that engineers communicate and listen differently than the person who's a uh, you know the uh that falls into the empathetic you know caring mode uh, not that engineers aren't caring, but there's just different types of, of not only listening skills, but how they how they communicate back. And if you if you talk to the empathetic person the same way you talk to the engineering person, you're going to get a different result. You know, you're gonna you're gonna you, your conversation may resonate with with the with the empathetic person, but not with the engineer, which is why you didn't make the sale to the engineer. You have to alter your communication style to the person you're speaking to. Uh, and to do that, there's ways to figure out, okay, what's this personality in front of me and what do they want to hear from me? And that's from a sales standpoint. But I think in, in general, from a, a general communication standpoint as well, it, it will help you in your, in your daily life. Great. What are some of the buckets that you talked about? And is there a, a test that, that you use that we can find online or is this something of your own? So I used, uh, the, the one that I like a lot is called 16personalities.com. Um, 16 personalities see, see the thing to understand is you not only have to obviously figure out who's in front of you but you need to need to know what your personality you have as well and 16 personalities will do that and then from there there has been so many uh, uh, s- studies and testing done uh, since since I wrote my book really that you know everyone's heard of Myers-Briggs what's your you know mm-hmm. I am a, I, I'm an INFM or something like that uh, but then there's the disc, there's the disc testing where you where you go and 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 find out again who you are, but who you're talking to. Um, the one that I like uh, the most to actually determine who you're speaking to is called the Bank System, B A N K. Um, that one there focuses on your the person you're speaking to, not yourself. So I like to find out who I, you know, I kind of know what my personality is and how I communicate. Um, and I know I like to talk and be gregarious and things, but I might need to turn, I need, I might need to tone that down if I'm speaking to someone who's not as, uh, who's like an introvert and they don't like that kind of energy. So this bank system lets you figure out, it's based on values. So what this, what people value kind of determines what personality they are. So if they value organization and um you know interest rates and and bank accounts and things they could afford it fall into and then okay who falls into that then this bank system shows okay accountants engineers um scientists blah 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 but if they value <clears throat> farmers markets and you know mom soccer meetings and all that stuff they're more of the the uh gregarious like can i get you a cup of coffee when you get into the house kind of thing what kind of personality, what do you need to say to that kind of person? So it's completely different. And, and, and the, the brilliant thing is if you talk that, that's why scripts don't work. Like if, if you follow a script, yeah, you're going to, you're going to, you know, it's make a hundred phone calls. You'll get two appointments because the two appointments you made were to the personalities that were, that were accepting to the script. Most people don't like scripts to begin with, no matter what personality they are, but you're already behind the eight ball because you're following a script and you're not paying attention to who you're speaking to. So when you would go into someone's house, how long would it generally take you to get a sense of, of what type of person that was and what buckets they were in? Within 10 minutes, you know, there's, there's also like, um, you, you look at the, you look around the house as well. You see what the house looks like, you know, you see what, um, what kind of organization they are, who did that organization like you normally I'm talking to a couple and if I go in and you can see very clearly I would say 70% of the time the house is organized and 
kept clean by the by the female presence in the house usually you know it's the wife not all the time but then I knew okay she's cleaning the house now what is the husband doing what's his role here is he just he's the guy who spends the money who does the budget so you start asking you know just just kind of general questions to find out who's in charge and then what kind of personalities they have so it would take me 10 15 minutes at the most nice and then going into someone's home must be an interesting challenge. I can imagine for some people it might make them more comfortable because it's their home, and for some people it might put them on edge because you are now in their space. How did that mm -hmm. normally go? Oh, 95% of the time people have their guard up. You know, it, it's I talk about this, I actually start my book with this, is, is I, I, I always wondered about the conundrum of, people needing a product but not wanting to talk to the salesperson who sells it right <laughs> you know we yep. never want to go to a car dealership we never want to go to a mattress store because we don't want to talk to the salesperson which is why online purchasing is, is such a big deal because you don't have to talk to anybody for the most part um, but when I started the book I was like I, I, I wrote my book uh, in in the coffee shop you and I met at in East Greenwich uh, at the Nook I wrote the whole book there but I started the book with, uh, I asked, I did, I did some research, I asked 261 people uh, over a two week period. So basically I sat by the door, anybody who walked in, I said, excuse me, may I ask you a question? And everyone always said, sure. And I said, very simple question, do you like meeting with a salesperson? And after 261 <laughs> people told me no, I said, I've got something here. This is very interesting. So then I got into why is that? Why do people not like meeting with salespeople? And it's because of what I was, you know, mentioning before it's the script it's not personal it's 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 the salesperson it's about making the sale it's not about helping the customer and they feel like they don't trust them there's no trust there so the same thing when you walk into a house they've got their guards up and if you start with a sales pitch or you start with a silly survey like the, some companies make you actually have a a pad and a pen with questions on it and you have to answer 15 questions you feel like you're you know you're you're being examined in an examination room all of these things put people off. So I would simply say, first thing, hi, Mr. And Mrs. Smith. My name is Alan from Anderson Windows. Just so you know, I'm going to ease your mind. I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not going to do a dog and pony sales show for you today. I'm not going to do anything like that. This is your appointment. It's not mine. So how can I help you? And that's it. And I would shut up. And that would, people would be like, uh, first of all, I would see the walls just kind of melt right away. Or many people would say, oh, my God, thank God. We had three guys here before, they were here for four hours each. Stuff like that. And I'd find out right away the issues they've had and what they actually want to hear, because they'll tell you. So you just you, you just ask a really good open ended question that makes them feel comfortable and then shut up, you'll you'll be in good shape. Shutting up is so hard for people. And <clears throat> normally yeah. they can do it for about a second and then they crack if there's no answer. So one thing that I'll tell people is have a glass of water with you when you ask the question or a bottle of water, ask the question. And if you can't take the silence anymore, then give yourself a drink of water and that will just make it take longer and give them more chance to answer you. 100%, it's a great piece of advice. Silence is people cannot stand silence. And, and that's the biggest, it's the number one issue for salespeople is uh, they don't listen enough. They, they, or they don't listen to understand, they just listen um, to, to hear themselves speak basically so they'll ask a question but they're not listening to the answer because they're thinking about the next question they want to ask or the, th or the next feature they want to talk about and they completely miss vital information that the customer is telling them yeah and I've also seen them just jump in with an answer too soon so you ask them questions and they they tell you something they tell you one thing they're looking for and the salesperson just jumps right in with the answer to that rather than kind of digging in and, and learning more about what's behind that one want, if there's something deeper. You're nailing it, Jeremy. It, it's, it's another huge problem with salespeople is they sell too quickly. As soon as they ask a question and the person says, yeah, this is my problem, they say, oh, great, here's my solution, here's my feature, here's my benefit, here's everything that I've got, and it's green, and it's, and it, and it's on sale this week, and, and the company's been in business for 35 years, and blah, 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 blah. Rather than saying when, when you ask an open-ended question, this is what I tell, this is what I train. You ask an open-ended question, someone answers it, ask another open-ended question. Base your next question on their answer. Tell me more about that. Really, describe for me how that feels. You know, 
hey, why am I here today? Well, our, our living room bay window is really, really drafty. So bad salesperson, great, I have these amazing bay windows. Look at these pictures. Good salesperson, tell me more about that. Yep. Well, it's been drafty for three and a half years after that rainstorm. Wow, describe for me what happened after that rainstorm. And now you're digging in, and now all of a sudden they feel really listened to and heard rather than being sold. And there's the big difference. Nice. I like it. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier is that you are also a podcaster. Yes. So as a podcaster, you're interviewing people, and I imagine everyone you interview has a different communication style in terms of speed or level of detail. How do you work with people who are maybe different than you are on, the, on the, some of those scales? Well, it's a great question, and, and you know, you're a podcaster too. And, and you, first of all, you, you want to vet your, your, your guests to make sure they're you know, enjoyable enough and have a good personality for the podcast for your listeners. But you get those. I've, I've had uh, uh, you know, a few where you get the one-word answer people. Those aren't good podcast guests. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes it hard. <laughs> that makes it hard, and, and and the same thing in sales. You get that person that answers with one or two words, and you're like, "Whoa, I want some more information." So, um, you know what? It, it, it's it's in a conversational way. For me, I, I I enjoy conversation. I I can talk to anyone. I think I'm a pretty good interviewer. So, um, I've I've actually done like uh, sometimes I'll call people out on their on their, you know their stuffiness so you know like i remember i had this one guy on and and i forget what the podcast was it was about 20 or 30 podcasts in and and he was one of those guys where like yeah that's it that's a good point alan and then he would just stop <laughs> so, so i would like so finally about you know 15 minutes and i'm like tony you got to help me out here guy you got to talk a little more so kind of a joking way so don't be afraid to use humor sometimes too to get to get people to open up a little bit yeah but what i've found is you have to be careful with humor depending on the type. Um, I was interviewing true. someone else, and uh, I happen to have a pretty dry and sarcastic sense of humor, and that does not always work with people. Yeah, exactly, especially if they don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, going back to sales, I just want to give an example of the best sales experience I ever had is buying furniture. And f I think furniture people are the least fun salespeople to talk to worse than used car dealers <laughs> and so you walk in and they hover over you and and just like you were saying about everyone else I'm like no leave me alone and you can't find anything in a furniture store they hide it and they even hide the map to show you where you need to go but we were not going to talk to a salesperson so we spent a <laughs> while looking at couches and finally one excellent salesperson came over and he said I noticed that you're looking at couches. Do you mind if I help speed up your process for you? And I'm like, yes, wow. that would be great. And he asked us three questions. And those three questions, he's like, with those answers, I've narrowed it down to these three couches. He said, but let me ask you one more question. Is it more important for you to be able to sit on the couch with three or more people or is it more important that you're able to take a nap on it and we both said take a nap he said this is really the one that's going to best suit your needs it was such a great experience because he wasn't wow. <laughs> selling he was asking us questions and solving our problem for us it was yeah. wonderful that's awesome wow give him a plug what was the store uh it was cardi's oh, okay so, awesome that's good to hear but I will tell you, there have been plenty of other salespeople that uh, I, <laughs> I, I ran away from. Exactly. <laughs> um, talking about people who give very few answers or very limited answers, I have an issue sometimes in groups where everybody talks more than I do. I, I'm one of those introverted people you talked about. And I found in a group, people are usually interrupting each other to talk and and I refuse to interrupt people so I found myself actually raising my hand when I have mm -hmm. something to say and everyone just thinks it's so funny they're like we're not in school I say well <laughs> if I don't raise my hand you're never gonna let me talk so that's what I do um, so it goes both ways in terms of how much people talk and just how fast they talk yeah and and especially when you're on like you know 
since COVID, we've been in the world of Zoom, so everyone everyone is kind of Zoom. They call it Zoom fatigue. Is it's a real thing, you know? So, but you get you get these. I used to run a, a networking group of twenty five to thirty people every Friday on a Zoom, and um, you're right. You get you you can just tell the the alphas in the in the group and the and the and the ones that just sit back and never say anything, and you know that's where facilitators become so important because you got to really control them from speaking. I've had to tell people to to stop speaking or or someone who's been sitting there and not saying a word, I would actually say, "Hey, do you have any comments?" And they would appreciate that. So, you're right. It, it's it's you know personalities. It's just, it's it's to me, it's just so fascinating the the differences between people and and their personalities and how they behave and how they how they speak. And um, but there are some universal truths in how the brain works, and that really is important to understand in sales because once you realize what personality you're in front of you realize that their brain is going to work a certain way, usually. Can you give an example of a universal truth? Well, social proof is, there's, there's, so there's, there's, um, uh, Robert Cialdini, if if you've, uh, you've probably read his book, the book, uh, Influence and Persuasion. It's, it's, uh, uh, just a world famous book. And, you know, he, he's a, he's a, uh, a scientist and he's done a million studies on influence and persuasion. And he has the seven pillars of influence and, Two of them that are enormous in sales are social proof and, and reciprocation. Um, pretty much, unless you're a sociopath, reciprocation is an inherent part of how the brain works. If 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 I buy you a cup of coffee, Jeremy, the next time we meet, you're going to buy me a cup of coffee. That's just reciprocation. Um, if you hold the door for me, I'm going to hold the door for the next person. If you get a Christmas card, I love this example. You get a you get a holiday card in the mail, right? And you you say, oh, this is from oh, this is from Uncle Tony. Crap, I forgot to send Uncle Tony a card. You're going to send the card right away. It's reciprocation. So in sales, you can use that by you know, um, in in small gestures like, for example, in in a home, I would do things like bring it, bring in their you know package that was on the on the on the. Uh, porch or I'd walk up with their garbage pail. And when I did that, people were like, oh my God, you brought my garbage <laughs> pail? Simple, simple things. And all it was, was I'm not, I'm not, they're not going to reciprocate with a sale necessarily, but they're going to reciprocate with their time and listening to me because I became a different salesperson at that point. But social proof is one of my favorites. I'll, I'll switch over to that. Everybody, the human being is a tribe animal and we want to do things that other people like us have done. We don't want to be the first person doing it. For the most part, you have the outliers out there. But for the most part, we want to make a decision based on what other people have done. And if other people have done that and those people are like us, we are much more apt to do it. So I'll tell you a quick story. There was a there was a salesman in one of those men warehousing stores, you know, where they have like a million suits you walk in. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to be the number one salesperson. So he decided to, instead of just saying, here, how can I help you? And the guy says, well, I'm here for a wedding. All right, well, what's your size? And then you, you kind of get overwhelmed. We've all, as a man, we've all been in those types of stores. He would walk in and say, how can I help you? And the guy said, I'm here for a wedding. You know what? Guys who look like you have your stature bought one of these three suits over here. Nice. Just like the guy did in Cardi's for you. One of these three fit your needs, one of these three couches. So he would bring them over. Now the, the overwhelming feeling of all of those suits disappears. Now he's looking at three suits. And he's like, these three suits, you're six foot four. Most of my six foot four customers buy one of these three suits. Which one do you like? And nice. he would sell almost 100% of the time because he used social proof. People who look like you buy these suits. The guy's like, great. Now I don't have to worry about anything else. I'm going to buy one of these suits. I love so it. When you, yeah, when you, when you speak to someone in, in, a, in a sales standpoint, you're speaking to a, hey, you're a podcaster. I just sold three things to podcasters last week. They've done studies of um, people can choose from two stores. One store only has three flavors of ice cream. The other store has 35 flavors. Everyone chooses the store with 35 flavors, but everyone who went to that store is less happy than the person who only had to choose between three. Yep. It just gets so overwhelming when you have that many options. So narrowing Absolutely. it down makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Back to uh, reciprocation, I was teaching a sales class for engineers. And one of the things I would tell them was to start telling stories. Tell your story. And I think reciprocation, it A, telling the story 
opens you up and makes you more relatable and it makes them want to start telling stories back to you and once they start telling stories to you you get so much information and the sale goes so much easier so I like the stories in, in their reciprocation yeah that's actually a great combination because stories is another one of my chapters in my book where telling stories is a huge part of sales and, and it does so many things um, it could especially like in an engineering standpoint and it can it, a story can help explain a very technical product in an easy way because using you can use analogies and metaphors um, but yes when you start to tell a story people will start feeling more comfortable with you therefore they'll open up more and then you're right if they start telling stories you're you're in a really good position excellent all right so how we met the first time was you were doing a class on body language Yes. And as mentioned, I don't always communicate exactly well with people. And sometimes I will stop and ask them. I say, I, I don't think that we're understanding each other. And and then I will get back on track. And it took me a long time to get comfortable enough to stop and ask. But I realized I stop and ask when I get a gut feeling that we're not on the same page. But you dig a lot more into the body language. Can you give us any clues to look for to indicate that people are not on the same page as you are? Oh boy, well, I mean, you know, you were you were in the class and it was kind of an abbreviated class, but there's so many things to look for. But you know, the gut feeling is really a good one. Like if you have a gut feeling, um, and I called it labeling um, in, in, in my course, which is what Chris Voss calls it in his book, Never Split the Difference. But when you see something, or you feel something, you need to say something. Because if you don't, if, if you're, if I'm speaking to you, Jeremy, and I'm trying to sell you something, and you purse your lips, for example, that you ask for an example, purse lips is a very good negative facial tell. If you purse your lips for a half a second, and I just keep going, I just keep talking about my stuff, <clears throat> I'm not making that sale. I said something to you or showed you something that made you feel uncomfortable or you didn't trust, and you pursed your lips, and, and if I just kept going, it basically, it's like you threw a rock and hit me in the forehead and I, and I was bleeding and I just didn't, and I just kept smiling. So you have to, when someone purses their lips, or another example is touches their ear when they say something very, very quickly, um, stop and say, you know what? I like to say, let me just pause here for a minute. Everything good with our conversation so far? Is everything I'm saying making sense? You just wanna give them a chance to tell you what's wrong and what I found is they actually appreciate that they don't know why you stopped they don't know they touched their ear they don't know they pursed their lips but you're just saying let me check in with you I want to make sure I'm, I'm not talking too much and they're like you know what since you said that I don't really I don't really care about those three widgets you were talking about you know and and he doesn't know he pursed his lips because I started talking about something he didn't want to hear but he did and if I don't stop and I keep going I've lost them but now that I labeled it and I'm like hey is everything good and he says no I don't really care about that then I say okay tell me what you care about boom now he's back in and he's like oh, this guy listens to me he's, he's really paying attention so it can really it can really flip the flip the switch on the on the sales conversation very quickly nice why don't people stop and do that more often do the is it because they didn't notice the purse lips or because they're afraid to address it and they think it's safer to just go by well they're they're a combination of all of it um, they pro they're not paying attention number one uh, if they see something but it doesn't register consciously it kind of registers subconsciously where you get the feeling that it's happening they still don't know what to do so they just keep talking it goes back to I'm not gonna I'm not gonna listen I'm just gonna keep talking because they really want what I'm buying what I'm selling so I'm just gonna keep talking about it because they really want all of these features and why would they say no? And they, this is what salespeople do. They just get blah, blah, blah. They just, you know, they the verbal, you know, diarrhea. And uh, they just don't know when to stop because they're not trained that way. That's the yeah. problem with sales training. They don't, they don't train salespeople to shut up. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> when in doubt, talk more, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to wrap things up with three questions for you today. Got it. First. What is a favorite place you've traveled to and what is one place you've never been but would like to go? Easy question. So two years ago, summer of 2021, I, did a, I went to Africa and I did a safari. That was my number one bucket list trip. Nice. Amazing. I want to go back 100 times. It was phenomenal. 
Uh, the other, the, the place I want to go, I really want to go to the Galapagos Islands. I'm a big nature animal guy, so I'd love to go to the Galapagos Islands one day. That one is on my bucket list as well. Hopefully by the time we get there, Jeremy, they won't be like McDonald's sitting in front of the, in, in the middle of the island somewhere. Yeah, we, we better hurry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two, who do you think is an ex excellent communicator and why? And this can either be someone you know personally or a public figure. So when you when when I first heard this question, I immediately thought of now I you know I think you're looking for someone who speaks, but I think uh, communication is is very important in writing as well. Um, and my favorite writer, it may sound silly, but I've loved him from the day I started reading him, is Stephen King. I think he's an amazing communicator, and he has a book called On Writing, and I've read it three or four times, and it's really helped me with my writing and how to actually communicate what I'm saying on the page which then helps me communicate uh, verbally. But uh, I would say Stephen King has helped me quite a bit from a communication writing standpoint. Love it. That I, I like his books in general and on writing is spectacular. Good yes. choice. And what is one piece of advice you'd give people about how to communicate well? We've said it more than once. Shut up and listen. <laughs> shut up and listen. That, I mean, just Maybe. shut up and listen. And when you ask a question, um, Make sure it's open-ended. Don't ask a closed-ended question, which is a yes or no kind of answer. And then follow up their answer with another question. It, it just, it, you, people will feel like you're listening. And when people feel like you're listening to them, you're gonna be well-liked, you're gonna be trusted. And if you're in a sales situation, you're gonna make more sales. I like it. I might change the name of this podcast to Shut Up and Listen. That's a good Shut one. Shut Up and Listen, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alan, it has been an absolute pleasure having you here today. Thanks for joining me. And if people want to learn more about you and about what you can offer them, where would they go to look? Pretty simple. Just go to my website, which is www.allanger.com. So it's A-L and then my last name, L-A-N-G-E-R.com. And you can find my book. You can find my podcast. Um, you can find all my links there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Jeremy. It's been great. Bye. Thanks for listening to How to Talk to Weirdos. Check out our website at www.jeremydoranspeaks.com. And follow Jeremy Doran Speaks on Instagram and follow our LinkedIn Showcase page, How to Talk to Weirdos, for more great content and to suggest episode ideas. Please follow us on your favorite podcast player to get our latest episodes. And remember, everyone is a weirdo to someone. <laughs>